Welcome, demigods. You're listening to Ranking Rick Riordan, a podcast about Percy Jackson and the whole wide rest of the Riordan verse. I'm Dan. And I'm Olga. And today we're discussing Percy Jackson and the Olympians, episode six, entitled We Take a Zebra to Vegas. Yes, we do. And uh, as we get into this, I just want to quickly say spoilers for all of the first book. Mm -hmm. I haven't been saying that and nobody's complained, but I just figure, especially because we're talking about the dream and everything and who the lightning thief is. If you haven't read the first book, we are going to. If you haven't read the lightning thief, (laughs) we are spoiling the lightning thief. Yeah, I just feel like it's necessary in order to fully talk about this. Yeah, especially I feel like we've reached the turning point with this episode about that. Yeah. All right. What were your general thoughts? Or do you want me to go first? You go first. All right. I liked it better on rewatch. It was a tough pill to swallow on first watch for me because it was another one where they drastically deviated from the book. Mm-hmm. There were high points. I, I really like the whole driving the car sequence. The taxi sequence. Yep. Out of the garage. I do Primo. I do like Hermes. Mm-hmm. I, I think that Lynn Manuel did a good job as Hermes mm-hmm. and he, he felt pretty pretty right in the part for me. Yeah. Um I think Percy and Annabeth had a lot of good interactions. I thought the uh, Iris message looked really good. Yes. So there's plenty to like here. I guess to me it fundamentally failed in that the casino wasn't fun. And it's it's interesting because I'm like, do I review this as like, what was it like just as an episode? Or do I review it as like expectations and adaptation? It's like when I'm here, oh, they're adapting Percy Jackson. This is like one of the key things I'm excited to see mm-hmm. because it's fun. And it wasn't fun in my opinion. Yep. So, so this is where I think my expectations in some way were lower. (laughs) Not in the sense of like, this is going to be a bad episode, but this is not going to, this is going to be a major deviation. And I knew that from the very second that we got the still of Lin-Manuel Miranda as Hermes in the Lotus Hotel and Casino because it is a casino for adults. And we see him there. This is not part of the book. And I was immediately like, well, by adding him as a new stop and yeah. part of the quest, this means that they're going to be discussing like the heavy topics. Yeah. It's not going to be the same thing. It's not going to be as joyous. That said, I did not expect them to fully cut yeah. on like Percy and Annabeth enjoying their time yeah. at the casino. Yeah. And, you know, we get we get that a bit with Grover, like with him being like, I'm I'm searching yeah. for a pit. Like, he does get immersed. He does get lost in it. Yeah. But even that wasn't like, yay, I'm having such a great time. Yeah. It was like, no, I'm fulfilling my emotional goal yeah. of, of searching for Pan. Yeah. And they make it even heavier with having, like, uh, older Seder there yeah. who w- was connected to his now deceased, uh, yeah. Grover's deceased uncle Ferdinand. Like, it's... Yeah. Even that gets heavy too. Well, and so, when, he's, when it's an old person doing it too, it feels like a dementia thing almost. Uh, I mean, sure, yeah, I like, didn't take it that far because everyone is yeah. lost in the casino. But the but the, he's the main person we're he- seeing as no memory. That's true. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just yeah. lost in it, and yeah. so uh, the other factor they know that they can't trust the Lotus Hotel like immediately. Yeah. So that to me was like a slap in the face. Yeah. Uh, immediately they're like, wait, we know this myth. Yeah. We we're gonna forget stuff while we're here. I'm like, oh, but why? Though? Why can't you know? Yeah, like especially when it's like it's not like they land on an island and see lotus flowers. So like it, it's yeah. I just it's hard to talk about the like why why do they just know right away thing? Because it's yeah. like okay, yes, they were trained in this. They know the myths. They well, it's read... also it's also Grover who yeah. reminds them of it. So yeah. he's like older and more well and Percy read the graphic novel which I did think was fun that was cute yeah. but like it is I, I, I guess it just leaves me befuddled it, like, I'm just like I mean I guess you could argue I will say in one way that the show is better than the book in this episode is it brings up the island and the was odyssey just going to we've been complaining <laughs> yeah. about the lack of yeah. educational mythology yeah. quality of yeah. the of the show overall yeah. and 
unlike the book, the yeah. book does not actually say ever explain ever it. explain yeah. what the lotus eaters have to do with it. Yeah. And it's a kind of in the book, it's like if you know, you know. Yeah. So I'll give them that and that maybe their thought process is we explain the myth so that you understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. But why can't even if they're going to explain the myth, why can't they explain it at the end once they realize something is off? Yeah. Uh, also, the fact is that it takes something away from Percy being smart and strategic, mm -hmm. especially after yeah. several episodes in the, in the book, of, in yeah. the book. Yeah. Yes. Especially after several episodes of him being like, I don't know this stuff. I don't know yeah. what's going on. It's like. All right, he might know what's going on because he read the graphic novelization, <laughs> yeah. but at the same time, it's still it's still not quite as like oh, but he doesn't get the like moment yeah. of realizing it. I, before I forget yeah. about the graphic novelization, mm -hmm. I can't help but wonder how much of it might be a nod to like Rick's readers who might not have read the actual Lightning Thief, yeah. but did read the graphic novel, or even like Walker or something, or even yeah. Walker. For all we yeah. know, <laughs> it has pictures. It's fun. Yeah. It counts. Who doesn't, who doesn't like that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think it's just. It's just weird to me that they make some of these changes like they, you know, and that's we're not even gotten into like they missed the summer solstice deadline. She gives them four pearls at the end instead of three. We're, mm -hmm. we're going to get into all the specific yeah. differences. But like there's a lot of things where I'm just like, but why, though? Mm -hmm. And I just come back to if we didn't know Rick was involved in this and we just walked this the way we watched the movie, we would just be angry each time they do one of these things and be like. I don't understand. Like some some of the things I I understand. Mm -hmm. Some of the things I get. Other things I'm just like you could have still had Hermes there. He could have shown up after they'd already done a montage of the kids having fun and and losing their thing. For ha he could save them from the Lotus Hotel even. Mm. Like I, I mean, he could be waiting for them outside when yeah. they run out and go like, ah, oh, you figured it out, yeah. huh? Like yeah. It's we didn't think you'd get this far. Yeah. The, you know how many people are stuck in there? You know, something. Yeah. And there I mean, there are good things as far as like I do like that they have a reason to go to the hotel and a goal as opposed to in the book. It's like, oh, we need air conditioning. It's hot out. Let's go in here. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's it's just a little it's a little frustrating. It is. It is. It goes into that like change for the sake of change a little bit. Yeah. But. I think I can rationalize it more in this episode than in other ones. Mm -hmm. I'm just a little bummed. Yeah, It's a famous set piece to me yeah. that really sticks in your mind. Yeah, and I think that that's why, like, going into this season, I think the two things I would have said I'm most excited, I think the three things I said I'm most excited to see are Medusa, mm. the casino, and the fight with Ares. Now, I'm, I'm pretty... I'm pretty hopeful about the fight with Ares, CGI notwithstanding. Um, but the fact that to me, they flubbed the other two main things. I'm just like, and it's also going to make me think very, you know, ahead about season two where it's like, okay, God. these are the moments I'm most excited for in Sea of Monsters. Uh, is he not going to be turned into a hamster? Is like, is he going to be like, oh, I know who you are, Cersei. Like, it's probably. Yeah. <laughs> I, guess. I mean, I how much of it is going to be different with Grover, Sorry. too? Yeah, probably a lot. I, a lot of yeah. our, I don't want to say our politics have, I mean, like our individual politics yeah. have changed, but like the, world. the world's yeah. politics have arguably changed a bit. And I'm not necessarily the, against them finding a way to do that a little differently. And keeping the trio together yeah. possibly longer. Yeah. But I mean, that's also a pretty big, Yeah, there's a lot, there's yeah. a lot of questions that get brought up yeah. that, are just going to be like, well, we don't know how they're in in discussions. It's going to be we don't know how they're going to change yeah. things. It'll make predictions a lot harder. Well, and I, I, you could say on the flip side, you know, that makes it more exciting as someone who's already read the books because it's not going to be just what you already read, right? But part of the fun of reading a book and seeing it on screen, as you've been yeah. very vocal <laughs> about, is seeing what you've envisioned come to life. come to life. Yeah. It's a fine line. A lot of it to me has to come back to, I'm sure, like taking budget. Mm. It's when it affects character development that it really Bum. gets to me. Yeah. Where, especially if they don't give an equivalent moment of character development. Mm. So for me, that's like with Annabeth, that to me, one of the things that I like famously knew about her character 
was she loves architecture despite yeah. her having like yes she's smart she's brilliant she does have the tactical mind but uh, you know as a child of athena yeah. but her as an individual wants to be an architect yeah. and Percy even makes fun of her being like, you with your ADHD yeah. brain, you like math and design and yeah. all, you're going to sit still long enough to design something. Yeah. And she takes offense to that. And she, it, it's aspirational mm -hmm. to readers, to kids, young adults, all of that of like, yeah. despite what my like neuro atypical brain mm -hmm can give me as a challenge, I can still find ways around that and have dreams and and find something that I care about, no matter what anyone else thinks. Yeah. And in the show, she's brought up architecture yeah. at the Arch. Yeah. She, but she's not tempted by an architecture building game in the casino. Yeah. She's not. What does Annabeth as a person like in the show? Glory. Well, I'm, she sac She yeah. said, "No, I'm not going to well, be like my mom." I mean, but I think glory. that that was that was who she was. He was someone seeking glory and approval, and that was and becoming the best warrior to seek that approval was her life. But how is that? That's exactly yeah. what Clarice wants. That's yeah. what Luke has said that he wanted. That's that's something that does not make her an Stand individual. Out. Yeah. And also isn't something you can connect with as a kid in the same way. As a viewer, yeah. it's a relatability factor. Yeah. Is it interesting for a demigod? Does it make sense for a demigod? Yeah. Sure. But what about Annabeth Chase? Yeah. Yeah. And that and that to me is where I go, what? Who is she? Well, and I think it's also important to point out that they say like a one-off line in episode two that like everybody has ADHD and yeah. dyslexia. I don't think they've, and it's, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, viewers, have they ever in any way shown Annabeth to have ADHD or dyslexia in the show? I don't think so. Yeah. And that was Luke saying, like, your brain is wired this uh, to Percy. Yeah. Like, your brain is wired for ancient Greek for all that. He like, doesn't even say He that. doesn't even say yeah. that. You're right. He doesn't. <laughs> the point yeah. is that that is a demigod trait. But I just, yeah. I, it, it's such a bummer because overall, I think that I'm enjoying I'm enjoying the adaptations mm. of Grover, of Annabeth, yeah. and Percy to me really is closest to yeah, Percy. Percy. Yeah. Um, but it's just not, uh, who are they? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think- Give me more. <laughs> I think we both have a tendency to be a little negative. overly negative because of how much we care about the book. I, I think that this episode, I really like Annabeth in this episode. Oh, I do too. I, I would, she yeah, is like, good. Yeah. I'm just saying. And they just refocus her story to be like about what she witnessed with Hermes and Luke. Mm. It's the things that she says while good, while the performance mm. is good and the writing, like, again, it's been adapted. It's a yeah. new scenario. The things she says are not really about herself. Yeah. Well, and uh, so now let's t take it a little away from the adaptation aspect. Mm-hmm. If you just look at it as an episode, the Hermes stuff, if you don't know that Luke is the lightning thief, is kind of weird, right? If you're just watching this for the first time and you don't know Luke is the lightning thief, mm. it's kind of like, okay, we haven't even talked about Luke really since episode two. We do uh, see him. Yeah, we see him. But like now we're going to have basically the, the the main drama of the episode be about he, him and his dad that we don't see him and his dad interact. We don't even see a flashback. Like we could have had a cold open with his mom or something if they really wanted to do like we don't we just have another monologue back and forth. Of, there's a lot of people just talking back and forth and explaining exposition and things that happened in the past throughout the series. Yes. And I I just think that's like, why are we like if, if you don't know that they're building up Luke for a reason, it's kind of just like this feels like a weird diversion because all you really get out of it is for like what well, the story we've had so far is, oh, it's hard for the parents. They can't really do stuff to help, which the Neriad at the end of the episode could have completely covered that when Poseidon doesn't show up. I like, mean, I uh, agree. Yeah, but like, if anything, if you don't know about Luke and Hermes, it's supposed to be a statement about like you can reason it as they are what Poseidon and and Percy could be. Yeah, it, it, that I'm not saying that's a great. I, I guess, <laughs> but, I, but I mean that's kind of true in the book too. By I guess by seeing how Luke feels about his dad, and then it's 
progressively disclosed yeah. why they have that backstory and what that and you get to see the mom and see how messed up, up she is rather than just and be like what happened and then find out what happened rather than just being told i i don't think i mean we haven't fully been told no we we, we haven't okay. been told we but we told we were told that he's a seer and that he's gone insane that like i just i don't think that personally and maybe maybe i'll change my tune once we see luke turn or whatever yeah but i don't think hermes adds anything i uh, like, again i i want to stay away from overall like series spoilers yeah. but i think that i do understand why this was put into act one mm. of the five book series as yep. opposed to when it comes up in the series overall i the I, book series I, I again like i would have been okay if it was more like a few hints here and there and i'll say i do think that when rick was writing the series the he first time know. he didn't <laughs> hadn't planned this far yeah. so maybe if he you know he's rewriting it now so yeah. he's pu putting it in earlier but i just don't think i don't think it really seems to add anything i, I don't think that he has a necessary point in this episode I, that and again i'm i like the performance i feel like he was the sa the right the character with the weight on him but mm -hmm. still has like a bit of whimsy underneath yes. it all yeah um I, you know i love the like dumb kids note that he leaves yeah. and stuff like that but it just the, the only thing i can argue is that like maybe they don't want luke's monologue to be such a monologue in the final episode mm -hmm. but it's like but instead you got Annabeth giving the monologue and Hermes giving the monologue. Like it's yeah. I, 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 no, I I can. My what it comes down to for me is I think they almost got it. I think it could have been a little smoother, a little better, and and I wish we had more whimsy in the Lotus Hotel. Yeah. Overall. Yeah, and I mean, like in the book, the Lotus they they don't need a car from Hermes because they use the credit card from the Lotus Hotel. Even that, like, I can sort of understand. Then you need a taxi driver. Like, I can understand why. Why is that a problem? I don't know. <laughs> just to focus it in more on the trio and well, not have another party there. Instead, they added Augustus, who they left in the hotel for all eternity. <laughs> How are they going to get him out? They have a quest to do. Maybe Grover goes back I, for him. I, I don't know. I think it's weird that they just leave him there. That's I, fair. I, yeah, but that's fair. I mean, I guess the thing is, the main person who would want to get him out would be Grover, and Grover yeah. was the and one Grover who was, out was of it. really out of but, it. Yeah. yeah, I'm just yeah. saying. Usually, when you set up a character like that in a show, it, you want to try to save that character. <laughs> I really think I could really see them saying, as everyone splits up at the end of mm -hmm. the summer, of Grover being like, "I'm going to go back for Augustus," yeah. or like, "Me and a few satyrs are going to go back yeah. for him," so that again they have the like, yeah memory or maybe something. they can use that to set up going in the next book or whatever. yeah that would be yeah. smart well, let's see if they do something yeah. like that <laughs> all right so overall yeah mixed reviews <laughs> as, a, as an episode enjoyable as an adaptation a bit of a miss yeah uh yeah and again there are high points for sure yeah but... and this is again just our opinion yeah. We'll get to the feedback part later, but <laughs> yeah. you can let us know what you thought. Yeah. So all that said, let's get into our list of the book show differences, all the big points we have here. And also, again, we're not saying every one of these differences is better in the book or whatever. Or just, even in that. Well, we think they're pretty important. Otherwise, yeah. we wouldn't note them. <laughs> but, but the point is that we're just saying these are the differences yeah. and we're going to talk about them. Yeah. yeah. All right. So in the book, Percy dreams of a standardized test with Thalia in the room, mm -hmm. and they're also like straight jacket. Yeah. Uh, and decides to go back to the pit from his previous dream to yell at Hades. Mm -hmm. At the pit, he overhears Kronos, not that he knows that it's Kronos, yeah. talking to someone invisible about the two items. When Kronos notices Percy spying, he sends him a vision of his mom in Hades' throne room. I don't blame them for not having Thalia. They would have had to cast Thalia yeah. multiple, you know, a season, a year ahead of whatever. Yeah. Um, but I do think that that's cool in the book that Thalia is there. Yep. Um, and I really like that in the book, he chooses to go back to the pit. Yes. Um, so, yeah. yeah. We don't even have the pit yet. No, I don't think we're going to get the pit. We're not going to get the pit. Until maybe the I think world, that, but, yeah. In the show. The dream is of Percy's old principal in his office at Yancey Academy talking to someone off screen. They discuss their war beyond Zeus and Poseidon's war. The lightning thief was given the tools to steal the bolt, but then he lost the bolt. Mm -hmm. Mistake has been corrected 
but he better not mess up again or he'll be replaced. Yeah, so some of that actually is in the dream in the book, too. Mm-hmm. I was just making sure I got everything that happened in in the show dream. Yeah. I don't, like, dislike this, but I, I do like that, it, like I said, I, it's interesting to me that it wasn't Percy actively choosing because so many of the changes in the show are making it so Percy or another character is more active and things don't just, like, happen to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I thought that was a surprising change. You're saying the show... It just happens, yeah. whereas in the book, he's making choices. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact, I like that, like, Kronos is taken aback and stuff in yeah. the book. Yeah, um, whereas it felt like an invitation in mm-hmm. the show. It's weird because in the show, he is at his old school, mm-hmm. even though it's seemingly someone else's dream. Mm. Uh, they make that more explicit in the book, that yeah. it's someone else's dream, and he is, like, witnessing a conversation. He's, e- he's eavesdropping yeah. on it. But in the show, he's, like, by it being a character that Percy knows, yeah. he was, like, invited in. Yeah. Like, whoever the, who the lightning thing thief is, it doesn't make sense that it would be Percy's principal talking to them. Yeah. So I think it... I mean... It's just kind of a different take. I, I think it's more that his his brain is honing in on a real conversation, but bringing it into a dreamlike form. Whereas the the book, well, the book is he's not even going to another dream. He's going to a real conversation occurring. Yeah. I assume it's a real. Con- well, that's the thing that's interesting because do you really think Luke walked all the way? Oh. You know, he's, he's not in the. He's not in the underworld. So maybe it is a. Very, uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I just think yeah. that this was a weird change. Yeah. Especially since we know we've seen the sand dunes in Percy's dreams. We've yeah. seen the shadowy figure. We've seen. I wonder if this is another one of those things where it's like, well, if we showed the pit, then they would be stupid if they didn't know what the pit was. Because Percy later brings it up to Annabeth yeah. in the book. Annabeth's like, no, it can't be. It's Hades. I'm not going to worry about this. Whereas they're making everyone like more mythology smart mm-hmm. in the show so therefore annabeth would be like it is definitely chronos yeah. i know this for a fact yeah. i know a lot yeah. <laughs> so maybe yeah. because she she does believe percy is like yeah we all have weird dreams mm. we all it must be hate like she yeah. has no reason to not think it's hades well you know what the, the other thing i could see is in a show i think it's a lot weirder if you have a sequence where it's two disembodied voices talking to each other because mm. that's the thing like in the book it's literally an invisible ter- person talking to a pit so like visually yeah, that doesn't work that's well. not like, super like, yeah like i'm a, i'm <laughs> not a, super easy to film yeah like i'm on board on with the visual of the principal yeah. and i do think that's a good way of adapting the like straight jacket taking a test yeah. thing. but yeah it's just it, it it really threw me off yeah i do think it's interesting that in the in the show they haven't mentioned the helm of darkness at all at this point because mm-hmm. that is what talking about like the two items that's one of the items they're talking about yeah. but yeah instead they make it much more about this greater i mean they kind of hint on a greater plan in the book too but it's more explicit here about mm-hmm. like the war beyond poseidon yeah like it, it throughout the rest of this episode the bigger plan bothers percy he talks to annabeth about it and tells the nereid they need to finish the quest because something bigger is yeah. coming so yeah. it's like okay that is percy making an active choice even yeah. though the solstice deadline is now passed yeah that, it, that yeah. he's choosing to m- progress yeah i i think the solstice thing is an interesting change because i i do want again it's the climax of the episode is to show how much he's changed that it's not just about his mom anymore that he cares about this mytho- mythological world mm-hmm. and, and, and helping people and i i think that makes sense i still think it, like it's a little weird that the deadline is passed but they're not actually fighting yet he's like they're, he's going yeah. to go marshal his forces well i'm like well, well what has he been what doing? Was he been doing over the course of the last 10 days <laughs> shouldn't yeah. you have been marshaling your forces that whole time because the war that's the deadline like yeah but, it makes the deadline like not really make matter. a ton of sense yeah. but i could see it setting up of like well percy you failed the quest you didn't yeah. do it and then like making an active choice of yeah. like why does that matter? Why does yeah. well, any of this well, matter? Well, the other thing is, if it if it was the book, yeah, and they chose to like rewrite this and say that he missed the solstice, then I feel like he would show up and like there would be battle lines drawn and a yeah. full army on either side, and he'd have to like stop the war. But they're not going to do that. That's a so, lot of budget. Like, yeah. yeah. So yeah. All right. Moving on. Uh, the book spends more time in the animal truck. 
it dives more into the bad conditions for the animals and shows our trio taking care of them. Book Percy can talk to the zebra. I like that because of Poseidon. Poseidon, can talk Poseidon to came up with horses. Yeah. Yeah. Poseidon invented horses. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> um, in the show, they play the animal release more for comedy. Yeah. You still have like the Grover being like, no, they're good. I'm blessing them. They're going to the yeah. wilds. But yeah. it's it's more humorous yeah. as opposed to earnest. I, I would say I kind of like both options. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do think the comedy works and is funny. I do very much like it in the book, too, though. And I, I'm okay because I think both options are solid. But the animal stuff, I feel like, stood out to me more when I read the book as far as, like, this book has, like, a message going on here. Yeah. And, like, also, like, I feel like it shows a lot about who they are as people, about, like, how much care that all of them take and, you know, to take care of these animals. But whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I understand cutting back on that. Yeah. Again, yeah. it's an efficiency, yeah. story efficiency thing. Yeah. Um, on the on the truck, Book Percy and Annabeth discuss spiders, mm-hmm. Grover's failure with Thalia, mm-hmm. Annabeth's dad's ring, and how Annabeth's dad apologized and wanted her to come home. Mm-hmm. When she did for a vacation, it went really badly, so she left again. Mm-hmm. And Percy says she shouldn't give up on their relationship. So what do you think about this? Because we we kind of got a version of this in episode four with the whole train car sequence. Because yeah. this is another one where I'm like, I was definitely surprised because I feel like the Annabeth and Percy talking in the zoo is also like one of the most iconic moments in the book. Yeah. But we did get a very good scene in the train. Yeah. It didn't talk about the ring and stuff, though. So. Yeah. And I, I haven't noticed it on her necklace, frankly. I think it is there. I feel like I saw it in stills and stuff before mm. the show was. I wouldn't be shocked if it comes up like in the finale or of something. Her giving it another try or yeah. something. Or maybe he invites her that summer instead of it having happened yeah. already. Yeah. Because, well, there's the whole thing. Doesn't she like give Percy her necklace in the book to like give him luck or something? I don't but remember. There's something like that. And so I could see like that being extended and her explaining the ring thing maybe maybe but it doesn't seem that lucky in in that context but (laughs) but again another really iconic purse beth moment that said i do like what they do in the truck instead yeah so um in the show uh they iris message luke well they try to reach chiron but Mm. it's the camp and luke is there with the prism uh in the book this message is at a car wash using a hose before they even meet aries Mm -hmm. Uh, Book Luke asks about flying shoes and they discuss Hades' helm of darkness. He also reveals that it was Grover that took him, Annabeth, and Thalia to camp. Yeah. Whereas we already have this information in the show. Uh, In the show, they tell Luke they think Clarice is the lightning thief. And he comments on Annabeth and Percy being an old married couple. And Annabeth ends the call when Percy mentions Hermes. I really like this sequence. I really do, too. I I think all of this... And again, going back to like even the Percy and Annabeth talk about her dad. Mm. This make this is a good example of adaptation. Yeah. You can't necessarily retread ground in the same way of like developing and introducing more and more information in a show of this length and of the genre, I think, mm. the way you can with a book. I don't I'm of both minds in that like I like what they do here. I do think that I do miss the ring thing because it to me, the ring thing is different than the other conversation. Okay. The other conversation is talking about how, you know, like why she got a strength and why she ran away in the first place. I think the ring thing is another level of, and so th- this is the thing. It's interesting because they give Annabeth such a specific uh, arc in the show that isn't in the book. Yeah. I, this is so core to the arc in the book. And yeah. I feel like her her like history is her main thing in yeah, the book. That's true. Um, and so her in the show, especially with the Hephaestus thing, it's like she's learning from Percy and what Percy is and how that can make her a better person or whatever. And I think that this is that kind of moment in the book mm. as far as him being like, maybe you should, you know, give another try. Don't give up on your family. Yeah. So I don't know. It's, but I, Percy in the show wouldn't necessarily think that. Well, he would about um his mom. And he's certainly not giving up on her. You know what? That's true. Yeah. So yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I going back to like the Luke adaptation. You know, not mentioning the shoes. Yeah. That was that was that was fine. Oh, oh really? I yeah. actually think that would have been a good thing to, for him to yeah. bring up. 
I think it works either way. Yeah. Uh, I instead they went with oh Hermes and his dad. Yeah, the that's cat. true. Yeah. yeah. Again, yeah. more the thesis, the yeah. <laughs> the focal emotional yeah. focal point of this episode. Yeah. yeah. So in the show, the trio seeks out the Lotus Hotel to find Hermes as so they they can get a ride to Santa Monica and away into the underworld mm-hmm. per Aries. Uh, they immediately know that this must be like the island from the Odyssey, but decide they have to go in for Hermes anyway. The book trio winds up at the casino by accident. They go inside for just like air conditioning and the bellhop kind of tempts them in Mm -hmm. for a break and gives them unlimited cards and hotel room and all that. They do not make the island connection and fall under the hotel spell. They get free passes and a suite and assume it's just a mistake. The casino is just for kids and Mm -hmm. it's like a mega arcade. Yeah. This is an actual casino. Yeah. The other thing about this, especially if you're like, oh, they need to know ahead of time because otherwise they seem dumb, is even more so than the Medusa thing where I'm like, okay, they did seem kind of dumb in the book. Here, I'm like, I can just... I can wave my hand away completely and be like, they walked in and immediately are taken under the spell. So yeah. I, them being stupid here doesn't really bother me at all in the book. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about how they have a blast in the hotel room and the arcade. Each of them finds games and activities suited to their interests. Annabeth watches National Geographic. <laughs> <laughs> she works on like a city building. Yeah, video that's game. the thing. That's where I harped on. Yeah. Like, what does Annabeth love? <laughs> Lori. Yeah. Um, Book Percy throws out the backpack from Aries, which we didn't really even see them get it. N- no, he does give oh, it they to do them have in a, the previous yes, episode. Yeah. It's just not as it's not a focal yes. point. Um, they eat a bunch of food in the show. They're worried about ingesting the flour so they don't eat anything. Mm-hmm. Book Percy realizes something is off because a kid has old school clothes and thinks it's the 1970s. Yeah. Percy realizes time is bending and remembers he needs to save his mom. He gets Annabeth back on track by mentioning spiders. I like that. They pull Grover out. It's hard for them to leave. And when they do leave, Aries' backpack is back and there's only one day left until the solstice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they fa- they don't meet the deadline in the book either. I think they, but might, it's closer. they might miss it by like an hour or two or something. Yeah, like the point is it's yeah. not already done in this yeah. uh, portion. So uh, a few things I do like in the book. I like that it's remembering about his mom that ultimately like makes him click yes. back in the place. I feel like they get the eeriness right in the show throughout. That said, I do like a lot the eeriness in the book of it being a kid from the 70s and yeah. he's still there. Like to me, that that feels really messed up. Yeah. Um, and we don't get quite that. I don't um, find it eerie at all, in, actually, in the show. In the show. In, um, I feel like you're supposed to with, with Augustus and stuff like that. I don't find that eerie. It's mm-hmm. just like sad. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess I can see that. I don't love the movies as well established. This is definitely one of the best and most fun sequences in the movie Mm -hmm. and in the book. And so, again, it's just like, why did you? I just don't get it. Yep. Yeah. So in the show, Annabeth and Percy talk to Hermes while Grover goes off with an old satyr named Augustus who says he's close to finding Pan. Mm -hmm. He says Pan is here at the casino, but it's actually just a VR game. Mm -hmm. Grover forgets everything and plays the game, but Annabeth and Percy don't because they have each other. Mm -hmm. Hermes isn't in the book, but show Hermes talks to them about Luke and Luke's mom being a seer. He has a lot of regret and says he can't really help the kids because it will just go bad. He also says Poseidon is the one who warned him not to interfere with his kids because it makes things worse. Mm. Then he tells them time is running out and they realize that it's a time warp in the Mm. casino versus outside in the real world. Annabeth and Percy find Grover and take him on a quest to find Hermes car. Let's pause before we go to the car stuff. Yeah. um, So I think there are a couple weird things here. One is... Are they going to explain why Hermes kept them in the casino and didn't immediately tell them and let the deadline pass? It, or is that supposed to be that he is protecting them because he wants the deadline to pass because he doesn't want their quest to continue? But I then think he, he thinks he's saving them by making... But then he gives them the way into the underworld yeah. and the keys. Yeah. So does he change his mind? Uh, it's a little... Or is he also under of... Kronos's, uh yeah. thrall? The... I, I'm interested to see if that comes back at all, because I wouldn't be shocked if it just doesn't get explained, but yeah. it, it might be. It but... might be. I, in some ways, I'd welcome that change because it gives it an explanation. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. if you're going to change things, like, all right. Yeah, I'm just like, why? Have a reason for him being in in this season yeah. beyond uh Yeah, it just that, it seems a little strange that he would... I mean, yeah, I guess he his main thing is he doesn't want them to 
to do it. But, but then, but yeah, it's but then he gives him the keys. But yeah. they do take him to the beach where maybe he thought Poseidon would meet them. Yeah, but he also gives Percy. them information about the underworld. Yeah, he does. So, yeah, as I was about to say. And that, I'd even argue, when do they actually change his mind? Like, I mean, yeah. so basically, Annabeth stole Percy Percy's keys, Hermes keys. Yes. <laughs> And it turns out uh, he let her take them. She thought she was so clever using her invisibility yeah. cap um, and gave them info about the underworld. Percy has to drive. Very funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the car brings them to Santa Monica. So so show Percy finds out. Well, let's talk uh, more about the driving. Okay. The best part of the episode. It really is. But I mean, <laughs> it's hard to talk about. A, a, Dan, I'm very traumatized. <laughs> By driving. <laughs> I am a late. Uh, driver's license haver, and let's just say I may have knocked off one of one of my uh, two of my uh, <laughs> two of my mirrors at one point, and mm. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it was really good. I thought that all the actors did a great job here. I thought that the comic timing was great. I loved Percy beeping at the person indignantly, yeah. Yeah. being like so naive and shocked that someone would. <laughs> So quickly. Percy, you're a New Yorker. You know, the, the horn is like a form of communication. <laughs> but also, I love that he does it when the guy is clearly way Gone. far away. Yeah. Uh, I also yeah. really appreciate the fact that with Annabeth, like, sort of backseat driving, mm-hmm. that he's like, you want to do it? She's like, no, <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I thought that whole sequence was, like, picked perfect. It was really cute. Yeah. Uh, and I also, this makes me remember that I, we haven't talked enough about the music in this show. I, I think the score is actually one of the best parts about the show. It's not necessarily that it's like the most memorable score ever, yeah. but I think that the score is one of the things that elevates it above the book at times because I it does a very good job of creating emotion and yeah. scenes where like you just don't have that in a book and between act seeing the actors' faces when they're delivering lines and having the right music at certain moments, like I think the music really helped in the train car. Mm-hmm. I think the the funniness of the music, yeah, and the, like the, the dire humor. nature yeah. Uh, yeah. at certain times, it's like I I think the music really helps a lot. So this is actually one of the things that I was excited about when yeah. the show you know credits were getting announced yeah. that uh, the composer of the score, Barry McCreary, is one mm. of my favorite like video game and tv Mm, composers like he's he's one of the best out there like he's done god of war walking dead um we haven't seen it but also like i think the rings of power Mm. witcher um he's got a lot of credits out there of really solid music for for media so and i knew that this was something that again it doesn't you don't always go like I'm going to listen to this yeah. piece of music, but it just re- he really knows how to write yeah. for entertainment. And really inject emotion. I think there, even in the first episode, some of the stuff with the mom, I thought, was definitely heightened above what it could oh. have been because of the music. Completely yeah. agree. Yeah. Completely yeah. agree. Yeah. So uh, show Percy finds out that they missed the deadline and Poseidon's messenger tells him it's okay, but Percy says he's going to go forward with the quest anyway. Yeah. The narrator gives them four pearls and says to go rescue his mom. Yeah, so this is interesting. This is a big change because yes. in the book, he, she gives him three pearls, three. doesn't mention the mom at all. Yep. It's also, to me, a, a kind of a strange choice within the show in that, like, that moment is about it being more than about his mom mm-hmm. and him, like, say, like, to me, that's why they changed it. So he missed the deadline. Yes. So then, so then after that, making it a, end about his mom felt like a weird choice. Yep. I'm going to reserve judgment about what all this means until we see what actually happens with his mom and Hades and, and the everything. underworld. Yeah. I, I think it, the idea is so that you go in being like he can save his mom and then maybe it will be that he can't. Uh, but it, it's, it's another one of those things where I'm just like, why do you keep changing things that don't need to be changed? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah. Why, why can't it be three pearls? Yeah. yeah. In the book, they take a taxi to the Santa Monica Pier using their Lotus Hotel credit cards. Book Percy tells his friends about his dream in the taxi, but can't remember all the details because of the Lotus magic, Mm. putting fuzziness in his brain. Mm -hmm. Annabeth starts to piece things together, but convinces herself it's still Hades. I actually really like this part in the book. I do too, yeah. Because she definitely, again, this is a good thing of like, she is smart. She does know what's going on, but she can't let herself believe Yeah, she's like, no, there's no way Titans are in all of this. Um, Book Percy takes a ride with a shark to meet the Nereid. The Nereid tells him Poseidon is forbidden from helping his children directly. She gives him three pearls and doesn't mention his mom. She warns him 
Go with what your heart tells you or you will lose all. I honestly think that what he talks about with the narrate is better than the Hermes thing. Because yeah. I feel like in the show, there's very often a lot of vagueness and they don't really get into like, he's not allowed to help. He's yeah. not like, like, like they kind of hit on like, I just made things worse, but like, yeah. They don't necessarily say that that's why does he yeah. think that or uh, yeah. And I, I'm also like the fact that they've never explained why everything's in America now continues to be weird to me because why would they show up in a casino and be like, well, obviously this is the island. I'm like, why? Why would the island suddenly be a casino? You don't like you've never explained why gods are here at all. Like, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, but, that's a great point. Yeah. <laughs> Why is this island <laughs> actually <laughs> a, casino. a casino? Yeah. yeah. It's also like if I think and this is well, why you, is it a casino for children in the yeah, books? Like, yeah, I mean, well, we know at least that why why it exists. But I mean, I feel like you could also argue and I don't know, but I you could extrapolate in the book that if an adult walks in, that it is an adult arcade. That, oh, that, that, like, uh, yeah. you mean a casino? Yeah, yeah, yeah. An adult <laughs> I mean, arcade. that is what a casino is. It's, 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 a, yeah. it's an arcade with higher stakes. <laughs> um, but I do think it's interesting in both the book, but also I'd say even maybe more in the show that there's almost like a malevolence to like, is somebody in control of this? Because in the show, it's like they straight up say like someone's pumping a pumping the Lotus into the air. Yeah. Why does like, Hermes hang out there for fun? Yeah. I, I I mean, it doesn't affect him. And he likes, no, I know, but he likes casinos, I guess. But, but why is he like, hey, all these people are trapped here for millennia, <laughs> frozen in time, yeah. oh, decades, I'm, whatever. Yeah, like, like I feel like no in, problem. The, in the book, it feels more like this is just like a magical place that exists. Mm -hmm. But in the show, I'm like, if, if it's being literally pumped through the air and it isn't just like innately in the air, I'm like, who's doing this? <laughs> who's who's like the puppet master? <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's Hades. I don't know. Well, if anything, this is another reason that makes me go... Oh, so Hermes is under the thrall because Ares is the one who brings up that you'll find him at the Lotus mm. Hotel and Hermes is in a bad place with people who are yeah. trapped there and he's just like, okay with it. Yeah. I guess it makes sense. if it, Okay, so if we're, say we're going with the theory that he is under Kronos' thrall, right? Yeah. Then it would make sense that he'd a want to keep them busy for a little bit, so they miss the deadline, so that the Zeus War does happen, but then still give them the keys and the ways to get to the underworld because Kronos still wants them to get to the underworld because he wants the shoes to bring Percy into the pit, and also the light and also the master bolt into the pit. The downside is one of the reasons that Luke is bad is to be like screw the gods. Yeah. And as an act of rebellion against his father. Yeah. So this would put him and Hermes on the same side of being under Kronos. Yeah. Unless Luke helps Kronos get Hermes under his yeah. thrall. Or Kronos just doesn't even tell him that he's also using Hermes. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying it would kind of lose something yeah. about the Luke-Hermes like relationship, relationship yeah. if it turns out they're both working for Kronos, yeah. but Ares doesn't choose to work for yeah. Kronos. He's enthralled. Yeah. He's tricked, whereas Luke would have chosen yeah. to do so out of spite. Yeah, we'll see. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not convinced that this is a uh, that uh, in some ways more interesting. If Hermes is also working for Kronos, yeah. in other ways it loses something. Yeah. So it <laughs> explains one thing. Yeah. <laughs> missing At another. least I feel like it would give more of a reason why Hermes was in the show. Correct. It but... would in the show and in this cursed yeah. place. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually have a question for our viewers. And on that note, feedback. Mm -hmm. Please send us your thoughts at our podcast feedback at gmail.com. Comment on the YouTube version of the podcast or tweet at us at ranking Riordan. My question is. Hermes was telling a story when we come uh, across him, something about, so the kids washed up on the shore, and then I say, you forgot hat. your hat, or something yeah. like that, and there's like a woman and a guy and whatever. Something about a hat. And a hat. Is this connected to a myth? Is this an Easter egg in any way or is whatsoever? It or is it just maybe. improv or possibly just like, oh, he's so charismatic, he's so funny and yeah. witty. Yeah. As he's taking people's money through gambling because he's yeah. the god of thieves. I'm inclined to think it isn't an Easter egg, but I could easily be wrong. 
I, I hope it is, yeah. and I just yeah. missing something. So if you might know what that's all about, let us know. <laughs> Speaking of Easter eggs, some people have said that they think they spotted Nico and Bianca in the casino. Mm. I think it could go either way, but it could. I don't just think be they would have cast them. So. Well, yeah, but it could easily be that, like you know, they'll recast, but it's just like a fun throwaway mm. for now. I, it could be a thing. I think it would be a fun thing. I could also see it be people wishful thinking. You, know. you brought up a good point that one of the messages of this episode uh, is the reason that Annabeth and Percy didn't forget about the quest is because they had each other. Yeah. And uh, Nico and Bianco, Bianco, <laughs> Nico and Bianca also very much have each other. But now, they don't really have a quest. <laughs> yeah. They might like, I don't know. Yeah. So like you can sort of explain it away and they don't forget that each other exists. Yeah. But it is a little bit like they're there for like 60 years and in theory, shouldn't have forgotten anything and maybe would. So it's well, yeah. Augustus didn't forget about Pan. He enjoyed the game at yeah. one point. He's just also eating nachos. Yeah. So maybe, I don't know. It's just, just saying. Kind of a, yeah. It's, yeah. All right. So speaking of uh, feedback, we got an email from Anna J. Um, we're just using a snippet of your email and feedback, but we read the whole thing. Yeah. Woo. Uh, so they missed the deadline. And they have four pearls, <laughs> tons of question marks and exclamation points. <laughs> what about, and you'll fail to save what matters most in the end? My jaw was on the floor. But like always, I hope this show doesn't let me and other fans down. <laughs> we had a chance with the movies. That failed. I really don't want to see the show go downhill too, but we'll see how the ending goes. So... You know, fast forward two minutes if you don't want to hear anything about the preview for the upcoming episodes. Mm, that's at the end yeah. of the, uh, the fact that there's a line about like, what about you, Percy, blah, blah, blah. To me, it sounds more like he sends the him, his mom and the two of them away and he stays behind. Yeah. Uh, and then something happens where he gets teleported anyway. But like, yeah, I think that might be the choice instead, which also is kind of a be kind of lame if that is what it is because he's already self-sacrificed twice in the show so that's not very <laughs> climactic yeah. um just like his mom yeah like, truly his mother's son <laughs> i think that it's not going to go the way that it goes in the book i mean obviously at this point it it's, can't. i can't <laughs> yeah but i wouldn't be surprised if they like lose one of the pearls or like they need to use one to save someone or i i don't know like, yeah i i don't I don't buy that all four of them will use all four all four pearls, but maybe that's just wishful thinking. I think it might be wishful thinking. Yeah. I think there's something there's something about the show that lacks a bite. Mm -hmm. There's it's a little toothless in yeah. some ways, and I hope and that that said, I'm not gonna go so far as to feel like this will that this is what it comes down to for like the season failing or mm -hmm. the adaptation failing. Yeah. Um, I just think that many of us just have had to readjust our expectations for how they go about adapting the book yeah. and that the final act very well just might have changes for the sake of changes yeah. and that might be disappointing, mm -hmm. but in some ways I'm already on that wavelength. Yeah. In some ways, I don't feel like they are building up to that decision in the show in that like, I don't think this this show has been about, oh, he needs to let other people make their own choices and he can't save everyone. Yeah. Like that doesn't really, I mean, I guess he kind of took the choice away from Annabeth during the Chimera thing. But like, I guess the thing is like, he's choosing the quest over his mom. It would be the, yeah, I guess they have built that up. But would you, yeah. would you buy that this Percy would choose the quest over his mom? At this point, Maybe. Yes. Which might be also why they're setting it up with the like, oh, I'm going to keep doing the quest even though you said the quest is over. It feels kind of, I'm a little worried that it's going to be like kiddied down yeah. for Palette a bit. Like it can't be too scary. We can't have a casino where just children are trapped for yeah. eternity. It's. I mean, one thing that I think can't is. can't let him lose his mom for real. That's why yeah. we told you in the first or in the second episode that she's still alive. Yeah. The thing that I'm like certain is going to change is how things end up with Gabe in the final oh, yeah. episode. I, I think yeah. he's, he's just going to leave Gabe and that will yep. be that. Yeah. Um, now that I think about it, I do think that they have set up for the character that, you know, he goes on the quest for his mom. And then at the end, 
he put, picks the quest over his mom yep. because that's what his mom would have wanted. I I can I still think that they're going to do a version of that. It might be mechanically different, they get there some way different. Or, you know, and also in the pro- pre- promo he's like hold fast mom, maybe he's like I'll come back for you. Um but yeah. then ultimately Hades gives her back anyway. So I don't know. I don't know either. I I I have a little bit more faith that it will be different but still good. I mean, the one thing I do think that they've been very consistently good about is the drama and the character moments. Yes. I believe that no matter what, the performances from Walker are going to be, and probably Hades too, are going Mm. to be solid. Yeah. Like, I, I think they've really nailed that and again with him at the camp and doing the sacrifice for his mom with the jelly beans like we've proven that he can do these serious speeches so anyone can argue against this but i think that the book doesn't necessarily build up to that climactic choice that well like Mm. i don't know that the book is really about you know him choosing the quest over his mom because i feel like in the book it's almost like a side thing that, yes, he w- hopes he can save his mom, especially because he doesn't know that she's al- definitely alive. Yeah. Uh, and it, he is much more quest oriented. I do think and you could argue it's like, well, the book's thing is almost about him grieving and letting go of his mom, which is also interesting because, again, they she's not dead from the get go in the show. Right. So yeah, I don't know. It, <laughs> it's interesting. I, I'm interested to reread that part of the book when we get there. Yeah. I'm interested to see what they change. Um, but. Yeah, I, I don't remember it super well, yeah. but I think that so far, like with most episodes, there are highs and there are lows yeah. <laughs> yeah. with adaptation, especially. Yeah. Um, all right. So we wanted to just uh, follow up on our uh, episodes three through five podcast. Yeah. since That was kind of a mega recap yeah. from when we were out sick. Yes. And we also hadn't because we were sick, we hadn't caught up on reading all that part mm-hmm. of the book. Um. <laughs> so from at I be the Igbo 1193 via YouTube, I feel that the Annabeth is formidable line in episode three was to stroke Annabeth's ego. Hubris is her fatal flaw. Remember, Electo wants her to hand over Percy. So she's being manipulative. She's buttering her up a bit. Grover, in that same episode, stated that monsters not only can smell demigods, they can also sense their flaws. Fear, ego, need for glory, etc. That is how I interpreted it. I like this reading. Yeah. And I think it it mostly works. The one thing I'll just say about it is that because before this we had yep. similar lines, I in no way I personally don't read Electo as saying something incorrect. Yes. Right. Like I feel like you're it that is supposed like in the world of the show, that's supposed to be true. Yeah. Because someone like Luke, who we trust yeah um has also said very similar things yes yeah. yeah it's like the introduction to annabeth to percy and therefore the viewer in the show was luke praising her as the best of the demigods mm-hmm. so in the meta even though it's completely like not actually connected with yeah. the same people by electo saying that it endorses that statement however you bring up a good point of supporting evidence and the, also our knowledge of the fatal flaw yeah. from the book. So it's it, it's like almost an Easter egg for yeah. that, possibly. It's too. also just it, it reminds me of the sort of interesting thing of when you make someone's fatal flaw arrogance, but then also make them incredibly capable. It's like <laughs> if she, she it literally is the best warrior, but she thinks she's the best warrior. Is she arrogant? I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Or is she right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Great question. Moving on to the Medusa portion of the episode. Book Medusa calls Athena jealous. Annabeth blames Poseidon for the whole thing of meeting Medusa at Athena's temple. Mm -hmm. Book Medusa is still into Poseidon. Yeah. Those are big differences. Yeah. The book mentions her sisters also helping her into the temple. Yeah. Show Medusa calls Athena self-righteous. The show includes that Medusa used to worship Athena. Show Medusa says she has a gift, and yet she's still super bitter. She says, Athena declared that I embarrassed her and needed to be punished, but doesn't say anything about the temple, just that she fell for Poseidon. Annabeth says this isn't what happened. The show did do a better job of showing that Athena unfairly punished only Medusa and not Poseidon. Yeah. Show Medusa says she was targeted by a monster, Poseidon, mm-hmm. because he abandoned her afterwards. Yeah. So I guess 
I think I like this section more than I did on a f- initial, initial watches. Watch. Yeah. The show and the book have different pros and cons. So mm-hmm. like I like that the book talks about the temple thing. I like that the book mentions her sisters. Uh, but it doesn't mention the uh, that she used to be a, a, like a worshiper of Athena. Yeah. It doesn't mention. She just says, I loved Athena. Yeah. yeah. It, it doesn't, you know, go into as much detail about like how it's messed up that, you know, Athena just punished the mortal. Yeah. But the thing is, like, obviously, like, how is she going to punish Poseidon? But, well. but I, th- I think that's interesting, especially because something I was reading about is that there have been more modern interpretations of this story as being like a victim blaming assault sort of story. And I mean, a lot of the times it is that uh, Medusa is in love with Poseidon, but there's lots of different interpretations. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. Well, we're going to talk about the Hephaestus stuff, too, and the Medusa stuff. There's so many different interpretations and versions of all these myths that yeah. it, it gets a little messy. And it's always going to be also from the perspective of the people interpreting it in their era of like society as well. Yeah, I do like, yeah, that they point out that it's, you know, very unfair of Athena. I, but I also think in the in the book, Percy's pretty mad at Athena and yep. Annabeth's mad at Poseidon. And I think there's a reason to be mad at both of them. Yeah. I, I And I really do like that the book talks about the temple and all that yes. stuff. But. Yeah. I also think there's an added layer of us knowing that Athena is like, again, like kind of self-righteous and easily embarrassed because because Percy sent Medusa's head to Olympus, mm-hmm. then she punishes Annabeth. in the show Annabeth in episode four of like not healing Percy inside the arch temple yeah. because of Annabeth. And that yeah. that's something that Annabeth finds out through Echidna. Yeah. So I, it's like, oh, that's consistent. So in the book, she calls her jealous. And in the show, she calls herself righteous. I don't know that I would agree with either of those assessments. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, fickle. I, like, I understand why the character of Medusa in the book calls her jealous. Right, because like, there's like a romance yeah, aspect I, of like, I, yeah, I God's don't, love. I don't think that's yeah. accurate. I also don't know that I would say self-righteous as much as she's like a god and she punishes people that do things she doesn't like. Is that not self-righteousness? Uh, I mean... I, you do things for me that I approve of. And if not, then I, I am the ultimate right. I mean, I would say that I'm not saying that like, obviously Poseidon is with blame here too, but I do think it is a wrong thing to do that in a temple with another God. (laughs) I don't think that's a positive. Like, I I think there's a reason to be upset there. Now the punishment in a world where the gods are real. Yeah. yeah, That's the punishment does not, (laughs) the punishment does not fit the crime, but I do think there is a a level of that is blatantly disrespecting Athena. Yeah. Especially as a maiden goddess. Yeah. Uh, So I don't know. I don't know that I call it self-righteous as much as vengeful and like, you know, overly punishing or whatever, but Other words can be used as well, (laughs) but I won't say them. (laughs) All right. So uh, episode four, Percy does not die from the arch. Uh, That's a huge change. Yeah. So, yeah, in episode four, he falls from the arch. Yeah. He does have his moment that we love with Annabeth where he takes the sword and flips her around and all that stuff. Saves her, Uh, (laughs) self-sacrifices. He's doomed anyway. So it's sort of like a different take on it. But I really like in the book that he chooses to jump because it's a literal leap of faith. And this is the moment where he's like, okay, dad, you either care or you don't care. I'm going to put my faith in you and try to save these civilians that are here in the way. Yeah, It's again, a very interesting change for the show because this is a very active, climactic, dramatic thing to do in the book here. This is a huge character moment. He jumps in the water. Yeah. Going into the river being like, this is your chance to say. Yeah. yeah. And I, whereas in the show, it's more like he gets, he gets some faith in his dad because he happens to fall and his dad saves him. Yep. Maybe they just didn't want him to have faith in his dad yet in the show. I don't know. But I just think that that was a miss for me. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like you could still have the self-sacrifice, but then back it up with something again more active there being choices as opposed to situations well and again he does have the active moment of of pushing in yes and and then in the hephaestus yeah well that's 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 the thing where i'm like i kind of because he has she has the hephaestus scene Mm -hmm. in the next episode i like i and i find it much more classically heroic that in the book he saves like normal humans yeah like he sacrifices himself just 
out of innate goodness, not because it's his friend right. or whatever. Like, yeah. You know. Yeah. So speaking of Hephaestus, episode five. Yep. In some myths, Hera threw him off of Olympus. In others, Hephaestus was trying to protect Hera from Zeus and Zeus threw him off. Mm hmm. In the throne myth, according to Percy Jackson's Greek gods, Hephaestus eventually let Hera go because Dionysus got him drunk and convinced him to forgive her. In other versions of the myth, Hephaestus demanded Athena as his bride and tried to assault her, and then was later given Aphrodite, so he let his mother go. Sometimes the Aphrodite story is totally separate. Hera, as the god of marriage, gave her to Hephaestus to end the fighting over... Who would marry her? Well, over, uh, yeah, who would marry her yeah. by the other Olympians. Yeah. In the show, Hephaestus is portrayed as a kind and tragic figure. Hera and Aphrodite rejected Hephaestus. From what I've read, he actually chased after Athena more, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Hephaestus trapped Hera and the other gods couldn't help, so they said if he let Hera free, then Aphrodite would be his wife. I suppose people, quote, gave away women all the time back then, so we shouldn't read Hephaestus as that bad, maybe. Emphasizing <laughs> her rejecting him first isn't that great, though. Yeah, so, I mean, on rewalk, I mean, like, and he is a tragic character. I mean, this is the weird thing about gods, right? Like, <laughs> he, he is a tragic character when you look at it from the point of view of him being rejected by his mom and society and, and you know, Aphrodite once they're married, like, you know, spurring him because of his looks and stuff. Mm -hmm. But when you also think about it from Aphrodite's perspective and she was forced to marry this guy, yeah. I don't actually feel bad for Hephaestus yeah. that she keeps on him. Yeah. So it's like, all right, regard regardless of like, if it's Athena or Aphrodite, you're like forcing someone's hand into being loved, which yeah. isn't a great response to your trauma. <laughs> yeah. And so it's it's interesting, too, when once you include the yeah. the Athena stuff is pretty messed up. They don't include it here, which I, I get. But yeah. like, there's a whole other story about like him trying to do things with Athena and then his sperm mixed oh. with her and makes a new human or oh, something. No. It's a whole weird thing. There's, God, a, there's so many the first incel. Yeah, there's so many versions of these stories that it's like it's it is interesting about like how do you be educational when there's 30 different ver like you have to pick one, right? You have to pick one, but um, also and this is the problem that we especially like to harp of like yeah. these these mythological figures have a lot of really disgusting myths yeah. behind them yeah. with a lot of assault especially yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. of and like using humans for their own mm -hmm. means and pleasure and everything yeah. especially and clearly each other like again we're about to go into hades ta hades, hades town, town. <laughs> we're going into hades town i mean one of my favorite musicals but the persephone hades myth is yeah. like really problematic yeah. and gets its own like reinterpretations such as hades town yeah. uh and again hera and her treatment of Hephaestus in the myth, not great. Yeah. But also, I think we can all agree Hera, not great. But also, Cla but also Clara loves Hera. But also mistreated by Zeus on a very yeah. regular. Zeus. Yeah. Ze we hate Zeus yeah. here. I mean, this the, the fact that there is a version, I had never heard that there's a version where Hephaestus is just trying to protect his mother from Zeus. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. I mean, that. Uh, yeah. That tracks, yeah. I guess. But like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so just just interesting stuff here. I I don't have as much of an I, I an issue with making him more kindly and and whatever. I don't have an but. issue with that. I just have an issue with like that's what you use him for. Like yeah. this is the appearance of Hephaestus the god, and mm. this is like almost nothing. Yeah, I I don't mind it. It's still such a strong episode. Yeah, that, and I yeah. and I think that Annabeth in that is really good. Yeah. It's the issue of like I wish. I wish Hephaestus was on a screen and being like, ha ha, got you, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Or like yeah. angry that it isn't Ares there or yeah. something. something. I don't know. Yeah, I, I just think it, it could have lasted a little bit longer. Yeah, that's really, yeah. yeah. Um, All right. But I also want to say one last thing is that I, because I mentioned the Percy Jackson Greek yes. gods thing yep. with, with uh, Dionysus. Yeah. There is also other versions where that's just how he gets him back up to Olympus, but not how he gets... Uh, hmm. Hera out um, he just it's like he's like a sign to like hey maybe you can get him to come back here and we can barter with him mm. um, but yeah so there's, there's so being many helpful wow yeah, I know <laughs> I mean alcohol helps sometimes all right yeah this is uh, all <laughs> liquid curry uh, I was gonna say this is sort of an all ages podcast <laughs> but okay all right from at uh, famk kovacs 4489 on YouTube 
I love that they use the song Baby Don't Hurt Me because Hephaestus is hurt by Hera and Aphrodite. At first, I was laughing when the song came out, but the double meaning hit really hard, and I like the performance of of Hephaestus. (laughs) Sorry. He looked just so sad and fed up with everyone. You know? Fair enough. Yeah. 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 Opinions. Yeah, I like the song too. Yeah, that was that, that was great. And Again, I also, a little humor in that moment yeah. of like, oh, what's happening? <laughs> and I, I don't think we gave enough praise to the like animations and stuff oh, yeah. in the tunnel. Yeah. I thought that was pretty cool when mm-hmm. I was able to also like rewatch it and pause through and stuff. Yes. Yeah. Um, definitely some cool stuff there. I also wanted to mention that that commenter had left a bigger comment saying what they thought the myth of the throne room was, mm-hmm. and they thought everybody was captured by thrones. I have not personally been able to find that version mm. if it exists so i just wanted to throw that out there gotcha well on that note well oh we're ranking yes let's be frank let's be okay i was gonna say sing it (laughs) (laughs) let's be frank it's time to rank this one's good but that one stank rank rank ranking rick riordan parsi and tv episodes Woo! Woo! Currently, we have Worst to Best, Episode 3 with Medusa, Episode 1 with the Minotaur, Episode 4 with the Chimera, Episode 2 with the Camp, Episode 5 with Waterland. So where do we put Episode 6 with the Lotus Hotel? Where do you put it? I think it is either better or worse than the Chimera episode. Interesting. I would put it, so I want to do something else too. I think episode one should be moved to the last place. Having rewatched episode three and gone through the various versions of the myths and everything. And I, I think there's enough good there. Also, a lot of my issues were with Annabeth and I, she's gotten so much better. And so that kind of added to her arc that she started off in a weird place. Mm-hmm. But if you still prefer to keep episode three at the bottom. I feel so mean putting episode one. <laughs> As the worst episode. Okay. You don't want to be mean. But. We can always see what Clara ends up thinking. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Our, our mysterious <laughs> <laughs> co-host. Yes. Yeah. I want I want to know what Clara says. I okay. think I think I'm really torn on on that. I think we should leave that alone and focus right. on uh, where we place episode six. So if, if it was below the Chimera, what what would that be above? Uh, Minotaur and Medusa. Okay. I think I'm good with that. Yeah. yeah. I just, again, and this is one of the reasons that I, I in my brain, still keep the Medusa myth mm-hmm. ad- adaptation there is, yeah. again, how it adapted the, actual the Lotus Hotel sequence and all of our previous statements in this mm-hmm. podcast about why that was well, like so a why, mixed bag. Why do you have more of an issue with Medusa's changes than with the Lotus Hotel changes? Because I can rationalize the Lotus Hotel changes better. And I think that what they did add has more internal logic to the plot and placement of the show as opposed to being like changes for the sake of difference or budget or whatever. On a personal level, this would probably be my my least favorite episode. But I think objectively, it's not the worst episode. Yeah. So and I also but the thing is, like, I don't know what is the worst. Like the really none of them are bad. Uh, in my opinion, so it is a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to rank these stuff because yep. especially there's so many positive things in this episode. It's, it's still to me they just they ruined. Uh, honestly, they ruined my favorite part of the book. Yeah, and so like that's how I feel, but I yeah. still think that it's not a bad episode. Yeah, and that's so. kind of why I feel and why I'm just like, yeah, well, we can sort of ding weird things with the yeah. chimera of like Percy not making a choice, but he makes a different choice and yeah. blah, blah, blah. But I overall like Echidna and the chimera and the train and Annabeth and Percy and Grover in that episode yeah. more. It's also just very streamlined, like yeah. getting middle, like it yeah. just, yeah. It's very cohesive. Yeah. So adapting something and then it being cohesive in a different way, but it doesn't succeed on an adaptation level mm. for us. That to me is enough to put it mm below episode four all right so, so that would make it make it what we three one six 
three one six four two five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here, a bunch of random numbers. I'm gonna put up a visual <laughs> there for, we go. on the video version. <laughs> um, yeah, especially now that I realize they have uh, episode specific uh, posters. Ooh. I'll make a little graphic. A little graphic for you uh, for your Twitter. YouTube viewers. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, thank you so much for checking out this podcast uh, on either YouTube or podcast services around the globe. The globe. The globe. We will be back with episode seven, which I am very excited about. I know. Wow. Per- pearls notwithstanding, I'm, I'm very <laughs> excited to see the underworld and what they do with that. So, How many pearls are you going to give me? Uh, only three, not four. Sorry. No, oh, I was gonna mm. ask for like five just in case. There are a lot of people I wanna well, I wanna fetch. Well, you're fetching <laughs> from the underworld. We're getting new roommates. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and may the gods be ever in your favor. <laughs>